Okay, well, welcome everyone. My name is Randy Johnson. I serve as the Habitat Program Manager for the Jamestown Sklalom Tribe. I began my career in fisheries here on the Olympic Peninsula in 1975. Was stationed on the Upper Wainuchi River near Camp Grisdale doing an evaluation on the fish passage facilities at Wainuchi Dam. Ultimately, landed a permanent job with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and spent 30 years in the habitat program working here in the Olympic Peninsula and 15 years ago retired from the state and immediately began working for the tribe on habitat issues. So welcome. I'm going to I'm going to make a presentation today on restoring salmon productivity on the Northern Olympic Peninsula. This will be the very first run through of this program. So we'll see how it goes. It's a big subject. So please consider the production potential for salmon is a function of capacity and productivity. Okay, sounds good. What are those things? <clears throat> well, capacity, it's like, so how much habitat is there? We see two lakes, two beautiful mountain lakes, A and B. Which one? do you think has the greater capacity? Well, it's A. A is a lot bigger than B. Which one's more productive? <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> We're just talking about capacity at the moment. Well, I already see my first glitch here. <clears throat> but capacity projects can be, for the most part, fish passage. That's the, that's the big thing currently happening to improve capacity for salmon, like here at Seaber Creek. At Old Olympic Highway and at Highway 101, we've had fish passage projects implemented pretty recently. Of course, the biggest and, and the baddest on any of the freshwater environments here has been the Elwha Dam removals that have enormously increased the capacity on the Elwha River. Even out in the marine environment, in the estuarine environment, there have been a number of capacity building projects like Pit Ship Pocket Estuary, which is out by John Wayne Marina, project done by North Olympic Salmon Coalition. Another awesome Salmon Coalition project out at the Meadowbrook Creek Estuary by, in Dungeness Bay. Project the tribe did in Washington Harbor back in 2013, tore out this roadway that truncated the estuary and replaced it with bridge. And one of the truly grand marine habitat capacity building projects, Killisset Harbor which is another North Olympic Salmon Coalition project where they tore out that piece of road that had blocked tidal action that was necessary to keep this tidal connection open between Killisset Harbor and Oak Bay. So now juvenile fish 
migrating up from Hood Canal can get right into Killisset Harbor, which is the best habitat for them that they could possibly access rather than going into Port Townsend Bay or around the outside. The greatest capacity building project, at least in the estuarine environment remaining here on the Olympic Peninsula is Gray's Marsh, which is a paleo mouth of the Dungeness River. You can see Sunland here on the edge of the photo, gives you an idea of where this is located. This was once this hundred and almost 200 acre estuarine marsh left, left behind when the river moved elsewhere. Then the, the outlet was blocked and a tide gate was put in and it became this bizarre little feature over here. This work was done because landowners, the landowner felt like that would improve the duck hunting. This was once the, the largest uh, complex of estuarine rearing habitat, which is especially important for juvenile Chinook and chum salmon, was the largest one in the Dungeness Bay ecosystem. <clears throat> oh, now, now let's move on to the concept of productivity. <clears throat> so in terms of agricultural commodities, which, which place here is more productive? Well, obviously it's A, and how do you know that? Well, for one thing, you can see all the bales of hay. B is a beautiful spot up in the high Olympic mountains, upper Cameron Basin, but you won't produce many agricultural commodities up there. Maybe, maybe a few blueberries, I don't know. It's a, actually a little bit high even for that. So it's through no fault of anyone that the Upper Cameron Basin does not have as high of agricultural productivity as the ag lands down by Town Road off of uh, the Dungeness River. <clears throat> well, what about for salmon? Which of these two reaches of the Dungeness River are more productive, A or B? Well, it's A. And how come? Because the gradient is lower, the river is connected to a floodplain, it's anabranching, it's got a nice natural log jam in the foreground. This is, this is highly productive salmon habitat. B is farther upstream. No one has done anything to harm this stretch of river. It just happens to be really confined and really high gradient, and it can't produce salmon like reference reach A can. Differences in productivity. Well, we're back to the ag land again. Which which one can produce more agricultural commodities, A or B? Obviously it's A, because what's going on with B? B is actually located really close to A, but it's being converted. It is not gonna produce any agricultural commodities in the future because it's being converted to a different use. So it has zero agricultural uh, productivity.
salmon productivity, A and B. Which one's more productive? A. A has a connection to a floodplain. It has beautiful riparian conditions. The river is shaded. Leaf litter, insects, tr full-size trees can fall in the stream, feed the stream, influence the geomorphology of the stream channel in a positive way. B is tightly confined. The floodplain is lost. Floodplain is off on the behind that the dike on the right hand side of the of, of the photo. So that used to be the floodplain. In fact, active channels ran back through there. And it was all diked off in the 1970s and converted. The, the former floodplain was converted into a housing development, Dungeness Meadows. So without making a value judgment one way or the other, we see that landforms can be converted and productivity for certain commodities either declines or disappears altogether. And now the Dungeness River can be wildly productive at times. Look at that, over 400,000 pink salmon came back to the river in 2013. Wow. And so this is what high, a year of high productivity looks like. Well, there are years of low productivity. You say, well, now, wait a minute. I just saw pictures of highly productive and low productive habitats. So how come they might change from year to year? And there's an intermediate productivity. These are relative from year to year. Well, maybe it's all ocean conditions and how, how heavy the fisheries are working on them out in the marine environment. Who knows? We can speculate. Why do we have these relative productivities? Well, here's a productivity curve for Dungeness Chinook. And this is aid to migrant survival. Or it could be smolts per female. It would be the same thing. So this is all in the fresh water. This does not include the impacts of fishing. Oh, I hear some uh, Pink Floyd sound effects in the background. Please check your mute button. Thank you. Oh, what? I got to tell you about Pink Floyd a little later on. Okay, so this is the is a productivity curve for Dungeness Chinook and in the freshwater environment, eggs to migrants or smolts. Now, what I want to know is what the heck is on the x-axis? Is that because something is explaining this mathematical relationship here. We got summer low flows, predation, high temperatures, migration, barriers. What is it? Okay, if only we knew we could do something about it. Oh, annual pink peak incubation flow. In other words, how high does the river get while the eggs are incubating in the gravel? That explains that much of, of the productivity question for Dungeness Chinook. And actually for Chinook salmon all, all around Puget Sound, you will see very similar curves. So is this how, how the fish evolved? since the Pleistocene, past 10,000 years. Over on this far side of the curve, on the right side of the curve, these, 
these will barely even replace a population. So what, how often do these happen? Okay, flows that are less than the two year event, we have some pretty good production, fabulous production 2012 when the river didn't even reach 2000 CFS, which is nothing. But as we approach a five year flood, the productivity drops and man, we get up to a 10 year or above and it is so, horribly dire. So why the heck is that? Is that just, I, do we just have to live with that? We have to accept it? Well, here's what is going on. <clears throat> There's a Chinook Red in a, a, uh, a side channel of the Dungeness River. In 1993, the state and the tribe were collaborating on a project to actually extract eggs out of the Chinook Reds. These were so-called eyed eggs. So they developed long enough that they had eggs and they're, they're pretty resilient at that point. They had mapped out the location of these reds, they, the spawning reds. They wanted to collect eggs to bring into the hatchery environment for a stock supplementation project. So this would have been probably January or February that they were out doing this work. Most of the reds were dead. There was nothing there. They were gone, the reds were gone. How come? Raccoons or otters maybe dug them up, eat the eggs. Well, the tribe did a, a uh, scour analysis in the river and put out a whole bunch of these scour chains. That's, that's Lloyd Beebe there. A few folks might have known him. So these scour monitoring devices, the scour chains, were put in places where you'd expect to see salmon spawn. So that's, that's what they look like. You've got the little wiffle balls on the top. So as the bed scours down and exposes those wiffle balls, the wiffle balls will float to the end of the little chain. If it doesn't scour, you won't get any of them moving. And if it's only gravel depositing, then the whole dang thing will be buried. Well, this is, is what we saw on most of these danged scour chains. It was a pain in the neck to find them and get them excavated again because they had scoured and the bed had built back up on the receding leg of the hydrograph. And so they were buried again, but the wiffle balls told the story. The reds were getting scoured out of the bed. And how come? I mean, is that natural? No, it's not natural. Salmon streams in the in Western Washington have have been treated so poorly by the European settlers. You would think that it was a war, open warfare, on on the salmon streams. Really, <clears throat> does this look like a productive reach of? spawning habitat. No, there's no, there's no structure. The river cannot spread out. It's terrible. So that's 1964, the nice new schoolhouse bridge and the shiny new Army Corps of Engineers levee that cut off 
all of this floodplain. <clears throat> so down at the, if, if, uh, excuse me, at the top of the photo is where that schoolhouse bridge is located. So this was the flood extent, these two miles of river before the court dike went in. And they, we just threw it away in order to build the, these two levees actually, and quote unquote, protect society from flooding. So that was a choice, that was a conversion and salmon productivity plummets when these actions occur. You have to have an area for the water to spread out or the velocities increase and the pressure on the stream bed gets more and more severe. So here's, here's a cross section from the, about halfway up that stretch of river we just looked at. So that was 1935, you've got this river channel and as the river comes up, it spreads out. And that keeps the pressure on the, and the velocities in the river channel low, relatively low. 1964, the core dike was built. At this cross section, there's higher ground on the west side of the river. So this is, this became the scene in 1997, the levee almost overtopped. <clears throat> Even though the water is flowing faster in the channel, you can still get accretion because processes are just so completely messed up that sediment is not being segregated and deposited and transported normally. And besides, where's it going to go? Where can sediment go now? A mile of, a square mile of floodplain, 640 acres of floodplain, a grading one foot with sand and silt is how much volume? It's over a million cubic yards of volume. It's lots of material. A river needs a floodplain to spread that out into in these depositional reaches up in, the, up in the high mountain valleys that are steep and confined. Everything just pumps through. This is geomorphically a very different area down here in the floodplain reaches. So here's the schoolhouse bridge again. You can see the core dike. Got these dikes, left-hand side of the river on the bottom of the screen is, is, ground, if you want to see them. is higher ground. <clears throat> so those are the dikes and these are the side channels. What side channels? I don't see any. Well, there are no side channels. We'll go upstream to an area that is less impaired and there are the dikes. I see one dike down there, right by the by the the railroad bridge is a dike. Well, we'll talk about that dike a little later. And look at all the side channels. Look how the river can spread out. It looks eerily like a set of lungs. It's like the river can breathe, it can spread out into these, into these areas and that, re, that creates stable, highly productive side channel habitat, which can be some of the best spawning and rearing habitat you'll find anywhere in, these, in, in your river system. And it also takes pressure off the stream bed. Now, unfortunately, that stretch of river does not have much for log jams in it. And that's the other missing component here. So two very different places, one that has connection to a floodplain and the other 
that used to have that connection no longer does. It's also interesting to find that juvenile Chinook rearing where they have floodplain channels to get into grow a lot faster and they get bigger. So they're going to be more successful and have higher productivity when they get into the marine environment. Well, here's some good salmon habitat up in the national forest. Okay, well, now that's a good looking river. Seems to be something slightly odd about those log jams, but they, because I see some pieces of cable and stuff. So what's that all about? Well, people have cleared log jams out of the rivers, out of our Western Washington salmon rivers and rivers all over the United States. This is something required to have good salmon habitat, highly productive salmon habitat. The logs create pools, they break up the energy, and they enable the river to connect with, it, with its floodplain. And indeed, there is a floodplain off on the right-hand side of this photo. And that was the specific reason why these engineered log jams were constructed was to reconnect the floodplain on the right-hand side of the river because loss of wood was the only significant anthropogenic stressor or human impact affecting this particular reach of river. So this was the prescribed treatment. <clears throat> the little photo inset up on the upper right-hand side, you see what the river had looked like here and what it looks like now. And it's such a different river for having log jams once again. Well, wh wh where did the log jams go? I mean, I'm, the way I'm talking, you'd think maybe there used to be lots of log jams. Yeah, there were log jams, all right. There were log jams up and down the rivers of the Northwest. The historic reports rave about the huge log jams in rivers like the Skagit and the Willamette and every, everything on down to the Ozette River, which I'll mention here in a minute. Splash dams were built for driving logs down rivers on the Dungeness River. We were still in the 1800s when the river began being cleared and used for transporting logs. And you can imagine that because the river would have been full of big log jams, because the river was meandering through old growth forest, that the first logs driven down to the bay, and there was a big market for piling at the time, those would have been the logs in the log jams. So you can clear the log jams and salvage those logs. And once the log jams are gone, then you can start harvesting the riparian trees <clears throat> like you see up here. They've been skidded into the river. <clears throat> and then you either just let the high waters take them down to the bay or you build a dam and then you, and then you release the water from the dam and let the whole mess head down to the salt water where you can retrieve the logs and market them for piling. And this, so this was happening in the 1800s. Well, and it didn't stop then. I saw these in, interesting numbers in a report. I mean, like Chehalis River, almost 5,000 logs removed to improve navigation. <clears throat> Arkansas River, man, 192,000 logs. This was a passion for, for folks to get logs out of rivers. Well, and not just for navigation, not just for flood control. Here's, this is a report that Mike McHenry and Mike Haggerty, 
who I think are, 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 are here today, they already know what report this text is from. This was a 1950s era report written by the Department of Fishery Stream Improvement uh, Division. So they began clearing the Ozet River in summer of 52, and it took 63 work days to get the log jams out of the Ozet River. So this is the river connecting Lake Ozet with the Pacific Ocean. And they say that these were overripe timber that had fallen in the river, and some were up to eight feet in diameter. And these 26 accumulations were in a two to four mile area of the stream. The stream was quite sinuous, so maybe they, had, they, they weren't sure how much stream length was involved, but they got in and they bucked them all up in the floatable pieces so they could wash away. And they say it was difficult because the area is inaccessible except on foot, the same as it is today, because this was National Park. And in fact, they mentioned that the, in the report that the National Park would not allow them to rig any spar trees for yarding the logs out of the river. And that might be one reason why they just bucked them into floatable pieces. So it was indeed National Park and it was undeveloped. There were no roads. Why would somebody remove log jams? And how could they even if they wanted to? So, so you walk down the Ozette River today and you think you're looking at a primeval ecosystem, but you're not. Oh yeah, all supplies were carried into the removal sites and they built a cat roads in there. This last part is really intriguing. Reports in the past indicated sizable runs of sockeye into the lake. In the, in the spring, silvers, chum salmon, humpies also came up into the lake and steelhead and a large number of cutthroat. Okay, why were they removing the logs from the river? It was in the name of fish passage. Those log jams were not stopping salmon from coming up the river. But this was a holy mission by the stream improvement crew and they moved from the Ozette to the Big River and to the Clallam River and, and gave those rivers the same treatment. And they worked all over Western Washington and with a zeal of a, of a fanat, of fanatics to get logs out of the rivers because they didn't want salmon access blocked. But salmon access was not being blocked by the log jams. The log jams were integral to creating productive habitat and calming the waters and keeping the salmon reds from getting scoured out during high water. Well, so that was back in the dark old days in the 1800s on the Dungeness and okay, the 1950s, but oh, well, look at this, 1978, the whole river, National Park Service out removing what had been a big log jam. This was up at the whole river visitor center at the end of the road. So the fact that you were miles deep into the national park did not mean that log jams would not get cleared out of the river for whatever reason. So that was 1978. That's where the log jam was. It's gone. Big, beautiful log jam, stable log jam, old growth timber, gone. Well, that was way back in the 70s. Well, here's 1986 and the, and, you know, not to 
particularly condemn the National Park Service, but you'd think they would be the last people who would be doing this kind of business. So if, they're, if, if they can't resist the temptation to clear log jams out of rivers that are under their jurisdiction, well, then nobody can resist the temptation. It's like a, something genetic. I don't get it. Just have to remove the log jams out of the river. <clears throat> In my early days as a permit biologist with the state, this was the in the late 1970s, I happened to be reviewing a bank armoring proposal on the Quinault River. Downstream of this site, downstream of the National Park. And a couple of old timers happened to see this party of folks on the stream bank and they pulled over and got out to see what was happening. And like I say, in 1978 or so, they, they were a couple of pretty old gentlemen. And they, said, and they commented that the river had not always been so wild back in their early days. Well, I was intrigued by that and asked them, well, so what, what, can you explain a little more about that? They said, yeah. The river, it used to be filled with log jams and it ran pretty slowly. And when the river got high, it would spread out into the floodplain, but it wouldn't really erode the banks very much at all like what it does now. Now it just goes nuts. I said, well, so what do you attribute this change to? And they said, oh, well, it all happened when the government came in and cleaned out the log jams out of the river for navigation. And that's when it went hog wild. And now it erodes, you know, sometimes hundreds of feet of bank, you know, on the outside of meanders with every flood. It's here one day, it's moved across the valley the next day. That's when it came all undone was, was after the log jams were removed. And these were logger type guys. They were not starry-eyed environmentalists, but they had been there at the time and had observed this. So log jams are removed and it leave, can leave this type of a river channel behind. And this is the Dungeness River at about River Mile 8. And the river here can access the floodplain if it wishes, but without any structure in the channel, it has downcut and armored its bed, and it's a mess. Well, there's really no end of what I like to say the the warfare against natural <laughs> creeks and rivers. This came from. 1935, an advertisement in the American Forests magazine about using dynamite to straighten crooked streams. You just lay out lines of dynamite uh, across uh, meanders, just link up short paths in between meandering stream segments set it off, it blows the, the uh, earthen material to wherever, you've immediately got a nice straight channel and you're good to go. Straightening channels is one of the most egregious impacts imaginable to salmon habitat. And man, has it ever happened frequently Little Quilseen River, for example, big Quilseen River. I mean, look at that thing. That was 1993. You can see that that the bulldozers were just recently going back and forth in this straightened, slicked off channel. There's no wood. <clears throat> this is the this is in the lower one mile of the big Quilseen River 
where ESA listed summer chum spawn. Well, no wonder they're ESA listed if this is the way we're treating their spawning grounds. And when the river gets high, it's got no place to go. It just gets deeper and faster and then and then also aggrades this mess because you're getting close to salt water. I had to include this, this, hor this horrific photo of the Samish River. I mean, that poor thing, it looked, it just looks naked out there baking in the sun. I don't know whether it was, it looks to me like it was probably channelized at one time, even though it has a few wiggles in it now, because water does want to meander and it will begin meandering, even if you straighten it, if it can. But look at the riparian zone. There's nothing. What an onslaught. I mean, the farming is going up right to the very banks. There was absolutely no quarter whatsoever given to salmon, none. Well, so no wonder salmon productivity is low, particularly if the rivers run with very much water. If they remain low all during the incubation time, then you might get good egg to fry survival. But if they flow with any energy, the eggs get scoured out and, and your river's a wasteland. Now look at this right, uh, former riparian forest, former floodplain. <clears throat> this is like paving over your farmland. You've converted it. Don't expect to get a lot of salmon production in this stretch of the river anymore, you made a trade, a trade off occurred and this has been converted. Salmon need healthy riparian habitat in order to be highly productive. So if folks, if society wants productive salmon runs, we've got to have healthy riparian habitat too. And obviously, we have to have healthy floodplains, and we and there has to be log jams in the rivers. And the lack of all these things is why you see that productivity curve on the Dungeness River that we see. Another impact especially on the Dungeness River and rivers in Eastern Washington has been water withdrawals for, for agriculture and in some cases for domestic uses. <clears throat> Believe it or not, the first industrial scale agricultural water withdrawals in the state of Washington occurred on the Dungeness River in the eight, it began in the 1890s at the Squim Prairie Ditch. That was the first one. I mean, the Squim Prairie has some really what would be productive farmland, but it's not very productive. Why not? Because the weather's too dry. And precipitation is part of being agriculturally productive. Well, you can compensate for that by irrigating. And so an irrigation system was put in and whoa, there it is today. And that enabled agriculture to flourish. And this was the, this area you see here was the number one dairy, dairies uh, supplying region of the entire west coast of the US at one time. Large amounts of water were withdrawn for the first 30 years of uh, after the Squim Prairie Ditch went in. There were not even any fish screens on the ditches, but you could see there are now. And that was a big improvement. A lot of water was removed from the river. 
that can that can affect the amount of Chinook spawning habitat, particularly when you're down below 100 CFS. Now this is just the lowermost 11 miles of the river, so this does not affect the entire river. <clears throat> well, in 1989. September of 89 was a pretty hard time for salmon. Irrigation withdrawals were 154 CFS, 33 CFS were left in the river, created a migration block at the, oh, at the old uh, Clown Klein diversion dam, which I'll show you in a second. So there really wasn't much habitat left in the river. And this is a bad situation for salmon. So that's what it looked like, 87% of the spawning habitat in the, in the lowermost reaches of the river was lost. Well, but, there, but there's the good news. The, the farmers, the irrigation community, the salmon stakeholders, Department of Ecology, people have really worked together, the Clallam Conservation District, Joe Holtrip especially, have all worked together and have implemented such great conservation practices that those terrible times we saw as recently as 1989 don't occur anymore. <clears throat> there was infrastructure. This is where salmon were blocked in. Now that's, well, the photo is 1987. I think it was, what was it, 87 or 89 that the, actually, that the pink salmon were blocked here. Folks had to round, round haul salmon and load them into a hatchery truck and truck them around this, but this is gone now. So there have been so many improvements in the irrigation system and in the just general water conservation that low flows are still an impact to salmon in the Dungeness but they're not, they're not one of the worst ones by any means, not compared to the loss of floodplains and the loss of wood and the impacts to the riparian communities. So here's what I call a benevolent river in, in summary of what we've seen so far. It's like the garden hose running into the grass it can spread out, there's lots of structure. It's not really doing much. The more water you run out of the hose, it just spreads out a little wider. It doesn't run too awfully much faster, at least not once you get a couple of feet from the end of the hose. Well, this is a dysfunctional river. At least it can still spread out, but it's lost its structure and it's kind of an unstable mess. This is when the river has been confined, and particularly if it's straightened, it's got no structure, it's not spreading out, it's just a mean, miserable environment and is terrible for salmon. So what do, what do we want to see in to engender higher productivity when the floods come. You need a healthy riparian forest, log jams, and a floodplain like we see here. Now these are artificial log jams. These are engin engineered log jams. Why? Because I can't, you know, I go through my, my library of photos, which is really extensive, and I can't find natural conditions, at least not, not my photo record, that have these elements to show you. Because our systems are so impaired. So we have to go up into the national forest where the tribe has constructed log jams and show what they should, what the river should look like to be productive for salmon. 
Well, I'm going to take a quick break here from the highly technical discussion and share a fictional short story. So I called my friend Mike. And I said, Mike, <laughs> you are not going to believe this. You and I are really lucky. I just scored us two tickets to the Pink Floyd reunion show at the Gorge on Saturday. And buddy, we're going. Says, oh, uh, huh? I can't hardly, really? Great. How are we going to get there? They say, well, I'm driving. Get over here Saturday morning and we'll pile in my rig and we are heading to the Gorge. So Mike arrives Saturday morning. He's got his little Yeti cooler and he's got some water and some beer in there and he's got a family size bag of Doritos and man, it's <laughs> sizing up to be a really good day. So we walk around back, get in the rig. And Mike says, well, we're taking this rig I say, yeah. He says, well, you got a couple flat tires there. Oh, yeah, uh, that's right. Um, don't worry. <clears throat> I've got a big truck tire in, the, in my shop. We'll put on there and we'll be on the road here shortly. Mike says, well, what, what are you talking about? We can't repair two flat tires by putting on one big tire. That won't work. Well, you mean we're gonna like have to call a tow truck and, and get the rig down to Olympic Tire or Les Schwab or something and get two new tires put on? It says, yeah, well, it's gonna cost a bundle. Well, it's either that or we miss our show. Okay, we're going to do it because that's important to me. That's a that's a value. We're going to see our show. Oh, and then I'll, my car will be running again too. And we did it, and we got to the show. That's what it took. Had to replace those, both of those tires. Couldn't just replace one. Well, so this is my metaphor for restoring these impaired watersheds. So I've gone through the litany of all the things that are wrong. So let's consider what if, what, if anything, can be done to make things right. And has there ever been a restoration project yet that has borne any fruit? Well, we'll see. So it's like your river has no log jams. It's a straightened channel. What are you going to do? You're going to fix one of them or both of them. To restore productivity, you will have to fix both of these. If you have to phase your project and you can only do, do one at a time because it's overwhelming, costs too much, you don't have enough landowner permission, whatever, you better address the, the prime geomorphic problem which will be the straightened channel or the diked channel, and then come back and put your log jams in later. But you're gonna need both ultimately. <clears throat> well, this is Moon Valley on the Big Quilcene River. And, oh, let me go back a second. <clears throat> It's mysteriously just following the hillside, the toe of the hill, even though there's lots of nice flat ground for it off on the left-hand side of the photo. Almost looks like floodplain, but the river's inside so deep, how could that be floodplain over there? Well, it is the form of floodplain, but here's the channel. Few, if any, logs scoured down to large rubble. It's a mess. 
<laughs> well, here is a, a cross section in there, the stream evolution corridor, and we're talking state stage zero lingo here, stream evolution corridor, 88 feet wide in, in where this cross section was taken is the 2019 stream evolution corridor out of a prehistoric evolution corridor of over a thousand feet. Well, is that, oh, and that's right up against the hillside. It was put against the hillside, that's why. So here's stage zero theory that you can be at different stages in a stream's evolution. And this is a really bad one where the stream is confined and it has down cut below the floodplain, the water table drops. It's extremely poor for fish habitat. It's also really poor for the land where the water table has dropped. You, you hear a lot of conversation in water circles about aquifer recharge. You know, one of the best ways to recharge the aquifer is to get that incised stream bed back up and that will automatically put all kinds of water into your aquifer. You know, Moon Valley looks like a poster child for this, this terrible condition that they reference in stage zero theory. So this is what you would like your cross section to look like. And this is what it naturally would tend to look like in these depositional floodplain reaches. Well, folks have been attempting to restore Moon Valley for about 20 years or more. And it began by putting log jams in this artificially straightened channel. <clears throat> and some were channel spanning try to build the bed back up and get it in contact with the floodplain and create some habitat also. There was a reach analysis done in 2004 by Herrera Environmental. <clears throat> and then that was followed by more log jams. Some sugar dikes were removed. A lot of money was spent. Interestingly enough in that, in the 2004 analysis, the potential effect of spanning the channel with three foot weirs was modeled. Now three foot weir would actually block the summer chum run. And this, this treatment would have six of those. And even with those in place and modeling with a, with a riverbed having it graded behind those, you still were not getting connectivity with the floodplain even at the 100 year flood. And yet the, the stakeholders went ahead and put in log jams anyway, even with this knowledge. It didn't work. Here is the current conditions of fairly recent hydraulic modeling of Moon Valley. And look at that, at the 25 year flood, that orange band is literally a band of death. Aquatic life can't live in that. So we're approaching 16 feet per second on the 25 year flood, which is not that, that much. <clears throat> so this is a straightened channel. You can actually on this uh, LIDAR see some old time, some old time uh, channel features like, like right out in here and over here. But the river was channelized. This has been heavily graded with heavy equipment. <clears throat> so the Hood Canal Salmon Enhancement Group 
uh, commissioned this modeling and they said, well, what if the channel were lengthened, were put into a, an appropriate native uh, channel pattern, lengthened, bed elevated, simply by the fact that you're lengthening it. Uh, and, and there you are, you've got floodplain connectivity and the velocities are significantly reduced. Now you can see water in some of the remnant channels over here and, and back in here. <clears throat> so this is the existing condition at Moon Valley. You could just put log jams in that channel. And this is what you would get. And hope like heck that none of them blow out because, well, I mean, what's the difference? Let them blow out because what are they doing? There's no floodplain connection. You're blocking fish migration with them. If one fails, then that three foot drop becomes almost six feet at the next one. And they're gonna come undone like the zipper on your jacket. Or you can just abandon that channel and build a proper channel and put your log jams there and get your floodplain connectivity, bring the energy down, create salmon habitat and build resilience so that salmon eggs can actually survive in the bed of this river. Well, so there it is, there's Moon Valley. Big Colcine cool River. This is what is being restored, uh, being proposed. It says restored. That's a, that, that will be the future condition. You can see that river is loaded with wood, a highly sinuous channel, and it's longer and it has connectivity with the floodplain. It's required the purchase of a lot of property and that has all happened except the Pollard will be closing in July. There's a, there is a sales and purchase agreement on that. Well, what makes anyone think that this quote unquote radical treatment might work? Well, that's essentially what the North Olympic Salmon Coalition did on, on Morse Creek. Morse Creek was channelized up here. That looks just like Moon Valley. I could say, yeah, everyone, this is Moon Valley. And if you had walked up and down Moon Valley, you'd say, oh yeah, I recognize it. It's just like Moon Valley. It's short and steep and it's a mess. And, and there was a dike here also. North Olympic Salmon Coalition came in, removed the dike, got the channel in its old oxbow, and this is what it looks like. And Chinook, Chum, Pink, Coho, Steelhead can all spawn in here. Look at the beautiful rearing habitat. So that's out there on the ground today, just upstream from Highway 101, you can walk it. <clears throat> Salmon Creek, similar treatment. It was channelized. It was put into a renatured sinuous channel. Same thing at Jimmy Come Lately Creek. Oh, I, I kind of glossed over these numbers. 1999, less than 500 summer chum in Salmon Creek, the 10 year average since restoration, over 2000 summer chum. <clears throat> there could be other things that go into that number, but obviously the channel's working really well. Same thing with Jimmy Come Lately, 10 year, oh, it, the run had declined to seven fish. A recent 10 year average, over 2,400 salmon returning to this creek. Speaking of Jimmy Come Lately Creek, this was the site of a major restoration project where the practitioner said, okay, We've got a mess out here. We're, we've got more than just one or two tires to change on the car. Look at all these things. And this doesn't even include the channel, which would be on the down, down off the, the screen. 
channel that need half a mile of channel to be reconstructed out of its, or renatured out of its straightened course. Now look at that. You're really gonna do all these things? It's like the biologist pipe dream, get real. So if you could do it, I guess this is what it would look like. You think you can really do all this? Well, dream, dream big, I guess. And that's what it could look like. So what actually happened? All these things happened in the early 2000s. So the stream was reconstructed. A bridge had to be built on Highway 101. That was built with salmon money. Salmon money that the that Clallam County received from the surfboard, build the bridge on Highway 101. <clears throat> There's our nice new stream channel. You can see it's going underneath the bridge. Here, there was no stream. That was a leap of faith. We're going to build a bridge to nowhere. There's not even a stream there. What are we talking about? Are you crazy? Well, it was a leap of faith. The stream is there. The stream is there now. Downstream of the bridge, the old estuarine channel was mucked out. It had been dammed. <clears throat> the industrial log deck road was removed. The log yard was purchased. I mean, look at that. Whoa, it's cost a bundle, just like me getting my tires replaced. It costs money. But that's what it takes if you're serious about restoring these ecosystems and adding or recovering productivity for, for salmon. And then, the healing really begins when you restore the habitat forming processes. So February, 2006 project had just been completed. And what, seven years later, look at it, it's even more beautiful today. How did the fish respond? Seven fish in 1999, they were put on life support with the supplementation project. And that has long since sunset set it in the past 10 years, which uh, during which there have been no supplementation or hatchery fish or nothing, all totally natural origin recruits NORs. The average, despite having had incredibly bad and freshwater and marine conditions in 2015 and 16, it's averaging 2,430 fish a year. And that's in a stream with less than two miles of, of access for summer chum. So that's, that's incredible. That's more fish than the biologists had predicted could have historically inhabited the stream. So it does work. Well, what about log jams? I obsessed about the fact that log jams have been removed. You can put log jams back in the rivers. <clears throat> Number one log jam practitioner here on the peninsula is Mike McHenry. This could almost be one of his Elwar River log jams, happens to be on the Dungeness. You know, they're really expensive. It's hard to do. A lot of pieces have to come together. Some of the sites are remote. You have to helicopter your materials in. Here you're able to get in with heavy equipment up in the up in the national forest. Some of our sites you can't. You've got to helicopter everything up. Here comes the anchoring system. So this site is about two miles from the nearest road. And this was the makeover that the tribe did. And yeah, it's great. The floodplain on the right-hand side of the picture is reconnected now. We've got incredibly transformed habitat up there. <clears throat> this photo is uh, on the right is a year and a half old. The, the river and the log jams have evolved since then. It's amazing. 
you can do it. It's really expensive. So here we've got seven log jams shown. There were more down around the bend. But yeah, you're talking like fifty to seventy thousand dollars a piece to build these things, and it's and it's really difficult. But that's what it takes. So down here on the on the Dungeness River, <clears throat> where the core dike went in, blocked all of the floodplain. Well, I say here current project. What the heck is that? Well, that just seems nutty. There is a project. And the county is working on it. I'll show you the site here in a second. This is the county's project. And then there's this black area up here too. The tribe is working on this stretch. This is called River's Edge. This down here is the phase one of the county's pro project. So here's the phase one site, 2012 conditions. Well, this is what's proposed. Really? Wouldn't that be great? Is it possible somebody's going to do that? That can't be easy to do. Well, here is the setback levy being constructed. <clears throat> there it was as of a few months ago, and they're, they're turning up the heat out there and really getting into hyperdrive now to build this setback levy. And then Town Road and the existing levy will be coming out out of the system this summer. <clears throat> well, now here was 65 acres that the tribe purchased in 2020. And we said floodplain restoration coming. Well, talk is cheap. Well, here we are in early 2022. The setback levy is in. It is there, and this setback levy will contain not just the 100-year flood, not the 500-year flood, but the 10,000-year flood contained by this levy. This summer, well, actually beginning next month, we're scheduled to begin removing the old Corps of Engineers dike down here and reconnecting all this floodplain. This area, is being reforested this year. And then we've got all the rest of this to do. So there's the, the noble uh, conservation crew and the volunteers out putting plants in the ground, 7,000 on this, this uh, particular installment. <clears throat> this is the downstream end of the setback levy where it will connect with the county's setback levy. So that's floodplain restoration. And man, it is so hard to do. Here's another example of floodplain restoration up at about River Mile 9 on the Dungeness River at Serenity Lane. This little road you see over here is called Serenity Lane. So it was 2015. The owner of these rental properties was concerned because more water was starting to come down this Anna branch. And this bank line, which had been riprap, was showing some erosion. The county, this was Greg Ballard, and I have to hand it, thank you, Greg. He advised that the landowners talk to the tribe and see if we had anything to offer up. And we did. We said, we will we will buy this and just decommission these. We'll relocate your tenants and then just let the river go. And the landowner who lived in the Seattle area and they had a lot of time growing up over on the still Guamish River. They love the rivers, they like steelhead. And they said, you know, that appeals to us. We will do it. So they sold the tribe the property about about the time this photo was taken, and it was only less than six months later. Okay, there, there it is, and let's look at this house up here. Less than six months later, this photo was taken, so that Anna branch had become the main channel of the river, and the 
banks had eroded further and that this was the nicest of the rental properties and it is fall, literally falling in the river. <clears throat> well, this was 2016, June of 2016. Look at that, the structures are all gone. They've been decommissioned, the septic systems, the wells, the electricity, the buildings, the tenants have all been relocated. This was a different property down here. This was occupied by a, a person that you saw in the news, on the front page of the newspaper for, for a number of issues back in this time frame because he was abusing animals down here, livestock and other critters. It was a very sad scene. That property was bought up and was decommissioned also. And five years later, this is what it looked like. So this is floodplain restoration, a little different than moving the dikes back. The residential development was decommissioned. There were no losers here. And this is what it looks like today. Well, what's the other option when the river starts coming your direction? This is floodplain restoration. This is moving people and infrastructure out of harm's way. It's climate resilient. It's environmentally friendly. You won't have to be back in here dumping riprap again. This big cedar tree, since the photo was taken, that's recruited into the river, formed a log jam here. It's all good. Well, the other option is to riprap the bank line, draw your line in the sand, <clears throat> like what happened down here. In 2015, when the high waters caused so much trouble at Serenity Lane, this was just a uh, literally a foundation, this house. And I, I don't know the landowners, I haven't been involved with this, but their response was to armor 500 feet of bank line, or at least they did their bank. I think this is a different owner. <clears throat> the channel migration zone is way over here. The river wants to go there. It has been stopped temporarily by the bulkhead. Up at Serenity Lane, they had a bulkhead too. Riprap bulkheads can wash out. When this one starts washing out, we'll expect to see more riprap dump probably. So these are two bank lines. This is Wildwood Lane, the bank line built in 2015 and I think maybe extended in 16. This is a natural bank line just downstream. This is on property, happens to be owned by the tribe, but it's in conservation status. Trees are recruiting in, are creating habitat. They are helping to calm the waters. Everything about this left-hand photo is good. There's no flood hazard here. Here, there's a flood hazard. It's just, it, it's just a kind of a bad scene, I'm afraid. So two, two alternative treatments. One, flood hazard abatement by retreating and restoring ecosystem processes. This, this one on the right is the more of the old school treatment. You draw the line in the sand and you fight it, man. Obviously building too close to the rivers is a problem and that engenders some of these conflicts. <clears throat> 75 foot setback. Well, when the stake was driven, I guess it was 75 foot setback. Look at there's, there's uh, flood deposits back here and the stakes just about to erode in the river. Have to be really careful about locating developments. And so the tribe is purchasing properties wherever possible, like the tribe had and the and state fish and wildlife have purchased a number of these properties so that we won't see those conflicts in the future. Where we will have one of the most productive stretches of spawning stream in the lower Dungeness is a so-called Dolly side channel that runs back through here. 
and <clears throat> tribe and the state are buying properties. We're working on another land deal right now to try to conserve these so that we don't have this conflict between development and salmon. Some cases it's a matter of getting infrastructure, old infrastructure out of the way. This was the terrible old creosote trestle on the Olympic Discovery Trail that began washing out. Also in 2015, tribe came in, replaced it with this environmentally salmon friendly river worthy bridge. <clears throat> And this was the old Howe Trust Bridge, which is the, still exists today. It was built in about 1917. There it is, provided 150 feet of opening. And on a floodplain that's about 1,000 feet wide, there were trestles on either side, which are not river worthy bridges. River got high in 1961, I believe it was, washed out the east side trestle. You can see the west side trestle over here. That's the one the tribe replaced in 2015 with a new bridge. The trestle on this side washed out. So the railroad came in and diverted the river back under the bridge. And this time they built a dike which is this, this dike right here. And the, the Olympic Discovery Trail goes up and over and onto the bridge there. That's where it is. You can see it better in this <clears throat> oblique air photo. This is the dike, comes up and gets on the bridge. These are some of the old piling vents from when the railroad was rebuilt across the channel, you can see from 1961. So this is lost floodplain. Well, wouldn't it be something if you could like just reconnect that? So there's the 1961 channel, the railroad dike. This is an opportunity for floodplain restoration and you don't get those opportunities too often. What if we just did this? Wow, I think we should. You know, we are gonna do it. We are going to do this. Well, it's too bad about the Olympic Discovery Trail. You can go down to Old Olympic Highway and still get around. Oh, wait a minute, we will build a bridge. We'll build a bridge for the ODT and we will, and this is in the works. This is, uh, the contract went out to bid yesterday for that project. What are the roadblocks to restoring floodplains? Scale, the cost, landowner willingness. This is the big one, having landowner willingness up at Serenity Lane. There was landowner willingness and we were able to do it. Down at uh, Wildflower, well, we didn't, nobody talked to the landowners. They responded the way people do and they drew the line in the sand. So what are the solutions? Well, you get a bad enough natural disaster that blows the landowner out or breaches your dike that creates an opportunity. A new system for paying more money, like paying compensating landowners more than just the real estate value. Condemnation never happened. Litigation, probably, well, litigation could happen. I think a new system for paying more money is the best thing we could do so that there are no losers. We compensate everyone. We do the right thing, the same as the guys loading the old car on the trailer, taking it down to Olympic Tire and getting new tires on it. It costs money, you do it because it's important to you. The number one habitat problem on the Olympic Peninsula today for salmon, Hood Canal Floating Bridge. Approximately 50% of all of the juvenile steelhead migrating, attempting to migrate out of Hood Canal, Skokomish River, Union, Dosi Wallops, Duckabush, Hamahama, Dewato, Tahuya, 50% of them perish when they encounter this bridge. 
<clears throat> work is underway to try to reduce the damage. This is like the, the Elwha dams of, of the marine environment out here. You, I mean, it doesn't make sense that the fish die here, but they do. And it's been very well studied. Really hope to see some progress made on this. There are other compelling habitat issues, floodplain restorations, log jam recoveries, near shore restoration projects, and the work, the, a lot of work's been done in 20 years, and hopefully there will be a lot more done in the next 20. <clears throat> we need to address capacity, that's being done. Productivity, that's being done. That's harder to address. And then the other underlying thing, it's like the engine in the car is ensuring that there's adequate spawning escapement. Well, thank you, folks. Looks like we are just at the end of our 90 minutes. I don't know if the organizers want to entertain any questions or not. This was the, fir the very first run through of this, this show. I put this final slide together literally moments before, uh, <clears throat> before three o'clock. So I'm glad to see that we got through it. Hope you enjoyed it.